so i hope you guys have the notebook open um and if you're going to be following along i'd uh, i'd say that install some libraries which we would need for this notebook and that will take some time to install so while we are uh, getting uh, acquainted just do these installs okay Uh, so I'll introduce myself again. I'm Manat Khanna, and I work as an ML engineer at Resli Tex. Um, and uh, today I'm going to be talking about uh, um, data loading and visualization, and we're going to be using the concepts that we've uh, previously discussed about XRAs. Why do we use them? Um, doc typing, uh, good code practices. So you will sort of have a practical demonstration of the sort of code. coding that we do at resletex um and related to the geophysical domain so um some of you i think uh, are from the earth sciences but i'll still for those who might not have an idea and since we're going to be looking at data we need to know uh, what it is representing and uh, where it's coming from so i'll give you a brief uh, introduction about the enp industry so uh, what uh the enp industry does with data is that it's trying to image the earth subsurface so for that we have different types of uh, um, data so today we're going to be talking about seismic data and well log data which sort of um in a way makes the lion's share of uh, exploration geophysics um so uh how do we acquire seismic data so essentially if i if i try to simplify it and sort of give you the picture of what is happening uh, is we trying to image the earth subsurface we are trying to image events reflectors so for that we have a source um, and we sending uh, a sound wave an acoustic wave and we are uh, uh, capturing that at the receiver and uh, so here ray optics comes into play you can see this uh, image of a marine survey so we have a source and we have reflectors and uh, the sort of geometry of this can vary depending on what our survey is but uh, this is the sort of data that we get so we are recording uh, the reflections um, and we are working with that to image uh, the uh, subsurface that you can sort of see here and we have different types of surveys so uh, we need a source right so for land surveys it could either be dynamite or a vibrosis so here you can see a, a, a vibrosis a sort of truck um, which sends uh, a continuous uh, signals as the source um, but this cannot be done in all terrains it sort of needs a, a easier terrain to work with um, we also have um, ocean bottom nodes which are uh, another way of acquiring data uh, while doing marine surveys um so this is what a typical seismic section would look like um i know this would not make a lot of sense for you right now uh but this is essentially uh, the imaging of the subsurface that we're talking about uh this is coming from a segwi file uh which is the binary file in which we are recording seismic data because we need a lot of information when we are working with it it's not just um, uh, an array that we can work with we need information about its geometry and other things um so segwi is not a human readable format um so uh, we need to read it and we need to uh, extract the uh, metadata from it which by metadata i mean the headers which would give us information which would give us context about the uh, trace data that we're reading um uh, so a uh, segwi header would consist of a, a textual header uh, which would uh, contain human readable description about the data uh it would contain binary data uh, of 400 bytes and this is standard format um it would also contain trace headers for every trace 
um, of 240 bytes. And of course, the trace data, which is the uh, uh, data consisting of floats that we're interested in. That is the information that we've uh, actually recorded. So SegWi data can typically be of uh, multiple GBs or even more than that in size. Uh, so which is why it becomes really important to have uh, a system of uh, reading the data and uh, slicing it. Uh, that is when X arrays come into play. Um, and because we don't want to use a lot of memory while uh, uh, visualizing our data or working with it. So, um, and also we talk about, you know, we talked about um, human readable dimensions and coordinates. So when we're, we're, we're dealing with seismic data, we're talking about inlines and cross lines for a 3D survey. So we need a sort of human readable interpretation of, uh, of finding the data that we're talking about. Uh, so I hope your libraries are loaded. Uh, you can also mount your drive to the notebook. I hope you're following along. And uh, just make sure that uh, the base directory here is uh, uh, contains like here it contains the name of the folder in which you've uh, put the notebooks and the data you can just copy that path to here so in my case i've kept it in this particular folder uh, your workshop data should be there so uh, Collab comes with certain libraries, but when we're, we're talking about uh, geophysical data, we're getting very specific with the sort of files that we want to read. Um, so we, we, for SegWi data, we're going to be uh, using a library called SegWi SAC, which is going to help us um, uh, read the metadata and extract the information. And of course, we're going to be converting it into a format that is suitable for us. Um, and we're also going to be talking about well data, which will come later. For that, we will need last year. That is why we've uh, taken care of those libraries. Our imports, again, a lot of libraries that we're using. Uh, so you, you should find this file in the workshop data folder. So it's a sample uh, SegWi seismic file that we've put there. Um, and we're going to load it and visualize it and see, do indexing and slicing. So here we are uh, trying to uh, read the headers. Uh, so SegWi helps us uh, really well in getting these headers um, by using a simple function of uh, bin scrape or get header. Uh, Either of them do the same thing. Yeah? OK. Right, right, right. Oh, you should have told me earlier. Is it fine now? At the back? So we've read the episodic headers here. This is uh, what it would typically look like. And using SegWi SAC to get it. Looking at the binary headers, so it contains information regarding the trace, the samples, whatever information is there in the file we can get from here. Now we're looking at the trace headers. And this information is essential in order to uh, look at the data. Without these headers, our, our uh, SegWi file is sort of useless to us. So uh, we were talking about uh, following good practices and doc typing our data. Um, so uh, you know, using this sort of uh, uh, using this sort of a format uh, really helps us in uh, modifying our code very quickly because we have a, a set format of how we're loading data. And this same uh, scheme 
would work for loading any sort of data. So, um, just look at these uh, classes uh, from the bottom. So, this is our uh, job configuration, and uh, we need the input parameters of the file that we're loading. We need to tell it uh, regarding where, how we, and where we want to write it, and also settings. Uh, so, let's look at what that is. Let's look at the settings first. So, um, the segwi file could be a 3D post tag, it could be a velocity file, and the domain uh, of the segwi file could be in time or depth, um, uh, the datum. So, uh, these are literals as in uh, where we are telling uh, the class that uh, it can have only these values. Um, you know, when we're talking about uh, uh, making sure that our code is not breaking um, and, and sort of uh, trying to make it a strongly typed uh, code. Uh, we, we are also going to be putting in the X uh, byte locations, Y byte locations, and inline and X line. And we get this information uh, from the header files of the uh, segwi, and it is essential in order to load the segwi file properly. Uh, so, we have these to play with, uh, then we have the input path of the file uh, where we'll find our segwi file, um, and file ID is, is something that we use for our uh, internal system when we are working with databases and all, so um, it's not uh, something that you need to get into right now. And then we have uh, our output uh, class, so where we want to write the file. Uh, we're also going to be creating an associated uh, survey file, which will uh, sort of give us the base map and location of uh, where our inlines and cross lines are. Um, and we can also put in a description, which is, uh, of course, optional. So, we've created a class to load a segwi. Um, and we're telling it that, uh, and we, we're using the configuration settings that we've uh, 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 earlier uh, defined as our type class. Uh, so we're telling it that if we uh, don't have uh, the uh, domain setting, our default is to use the time domain. Um, and we're creating a segway loader uh, with all these sort of information that we're putting in our settings. Uh, and uh, our uh, XRA can also have some attributes as you might have looked when we were creating the XRAs. Uh, so we can put it some associated information about uh, uh, our XRA. So this function uh, is essentially what it is doing in case it's not clear is it will take in the segway file and convert it to a format uh, suitable to us. So uh, we're using of course XRAs, we talked extensively about why we're using it. Um, and it's also creating a survey file, uh, again, taking in the uh, 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 values from the classes that we've created. So let me run this uh, class. So it's not. Um, so you might ask why we're uh, making a class and not simply creating a function. Uh, it's something we use for our, uh, how our internal system works, and there are reasons for it, but uh, you need not get into it. Alternatively, what you can do is you can just simply run this function. Uh, but since I've used that class, I'll uh, have to run it separately. Um, Okay, let me just run it and come back to it because it will take time to convert it. You can also run these cells because it will uh, take time to load the segway and convert it. Okay, so this is where we are uh, running the function. So it will take a couple minutes, it will take four or five minutes. So. so Right here, we are telling it what our settings are, uh, which we had 
very uh, nicely put in uh, class. Uh, so our file type is the 3D post tag, the example file, and uh, other information that we have. And these byte locations we have taken from the header scan that we've done. Uh, so when you're loading any file, you can look at that and, and change these values. Uh, the input path is, uh, if, if you've uh, loaded the workshop data folder, it should work because uh, we have earlier given the uh, di uh, directory path. Uh, and we have created a new folder loaded. So it will uh, output two files. So one will be this uh, netcdf file, uh, uh, which will contain our XRA. And the other one is the associated survey file, which is a CSV file, which you might know what it is. Uh, it's a simple uh, comma separated or tab separated um, sort of array. Uh, and we've put in a description. You can change it to whatever you want. So uh, how many have you, uh, how many of you have actually looked at a segue file before in a software or Python, yeah. So you, so you know that uh, it's uh, uh, it's an entire process to load a segue in itself. Um, but uh, this sort of uh, segue stack is a very helpful library if you are planning on uh, uh, doing ML projects related to seismic. So you need to read those segue files into your notebooks or wherever you're wor working. So you can look at the headers and uh, load that file. And of course, we encourage you to use XRAs. Um, okay, so I should now have a .nc file here also. It'll take a minute to show up. So it was a big file. The original segway was 1 GB. Uh, and this NC file is also of the same order. So now what we're going to do is we're going to load this uh, netcdf file that we created using XArray. And look at it. And here you'll be able to see all those concepts that we talked about and sort of see the uh, why they're so useful. So we have the dimensions of depth, cross line, and inline. And uh, now, uh, see how very beautifully it's become human readable. And we know what we're looking at. Um, we also have our coordinates. And uh, of course, the data contains uh, our actual float values and uh, what we are uh, interested in seeing. Um, and we can put other files using these same dimensions and coordinates. And this has made it now very easy for us to look at the data. Um, so maybe you can, uh, in the meanwhile, try to load this velocity file. You can take like uh, five minutes to uh, uh, load it. And you'll also get to see uh, how you, you can change the settings. Uh, uh, mainly, you'll have to change the settings and uh, uh, see uh, like also the input path. So you can maybe take a couple minutes and try it out. I hope you guys have the workshop data folder loaded. So you can look at the code above and do it. And in case uh, we're not able to figure it out right now, we'll put the solutions of this here. And you can uh, look at a sort of different file and see um, how that would look like. OK, so I hope like at least you were able to uh, load one segway, maybe even running the cells that were already there. Um, but of course, you can play around and load it. Like uh, The no notebook contains a very nice uh, function to uh, load segway and convert it to XArray. Um, so you should be able to. OK, OK. Um, 
so you can go to the uh, 001 notebook and at the end you will find a hyperlink of data that is the path to the workshop data folder in case you've not found it so uh, you can play around with that later you guys have the notebook so you'll have the hyperlink um so let's move on um now we're moving on to visualization uh using our xrays uh so let us first look at the survey file that we'd created okay so uh, this is the uh, data frame uh, it contains the trace number and the associated uh, x and y locations uh, and also what inline and cross line it is so we can plot it so this is what we'll call a base map and it's a scatter plot it will plot all those traces uh with their x and y coordinates um uh, and uh, so the survey has been conducted like this so if you uh, take a section like this and a section like this uh you'll get a particular cross line and in line at that point so again this is useful uh, information um uh, these visualizations are really helpful when we trying to understand our data So let's move on to visualizing the uh, segway file uh, from the XRS that we had created. So now we're going to uh, load the NC file using XRA open data set. Uh, and if you were able to create the NC file, uh, you should be able to load it. In case you're not able to uh, create the NC file. Uh, in the repo we're going to update and put the loaded nc files as well so at least you can do the visualizations um and know what the file is actually supposed to look like in case you're loading it incorrectly uh, so this is our xra uh, and again now we want to look at an inline slice and we know that we want to look at the inline sli uh, slice 10000 so we don't have to get into uh, all those uh, complicate uh, complications of Uh, trying to figure out how to slice it we can simply uh, uh, put uh, xra dot select and our inline number or cross line number whatever slice we want to look at so we get our inline slice and now we can plot it so using plotly to plot it uh, and we've talked about the advantages of plotly uh, and uh, since we've loaded uh, our data into an x array it will also uh, plot the correct labels for the axes and uh, the the visualization will have meaning to it so we're plotting our in line uh, and we're using this color map uh, let's see how that looks like we're plotting in line 10000 so it takes some some time but you can see that uh, the array i have taken is uh, inline slice uh, data and i have transposed it so i'd also like you to think about why we are transposing the data while plotting it if anyone can think of why we do that why are we transposing the data before plotting it look at the image that comes up maybe that will give you an idea look at the axis which axis is plotted where
Yeah, yeah. So we see if it's still working. So you've looked at a segway file, right? So any ideas why is it that we're transposing the data before uh, plotting it? Yeah, and, and why would we not get that if we don't do the transpose? Right, right, right. So what she's saying is that uh, for our seismic section, we want the time or the depth domain to be uh, on the y-axis, and we're looking at uh, our uh, CMPs uh, in case of post-tac uh, on the x-axis. And how uh, uh, the uh, in in C type in Python the uh, time axis is the fastest uh, dimension, so that is why it's on the horizontal axis. So if we want to plot it on the vertical uh, axis, we need to transpose the data always before plotting it. So we can see that we have our image. This is in line 10,000. And so, of course, this uh, you might you will not be able to actually make sense of this image uh, because there are a lot of uh, pixels in the trace, and we do not we are not plotting it with that much resolution. Uh, so you can play around uh, with the height of the image because. Uh, you might know about aliasing. So we need to make sure that uh, the information that we want to look at, we have at least uh, twice that, uh, 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 twice of those pixels in our image. So we can play around with the aspect ratio. But this is a bigger image, so. Uh, so typically, uh, if you're trying to plot seismic data, um, make sure the color scale that you're using uh, is, is something that would make sense for seismic data. So you typically use uh, either gray or uh, uh, red, blue. So you can play around with that. Sorry? Yeah, uh, for the image, I've zoomed it out so that you're able to see the image when it comes. So I've changed the uh, height of the image. Even with Plotly, it's pretty heavy duty to plot it. Uh, it's a big seismic file. Again, it's crashed. So you can play, play around with this. Uh, you can also uh, play around with Zmin and Zmax, and uh, maybe look at the uh, data itself. Uh, maybe you guys, uh, some of you are familiar with NumPy, so you can use uh, mp.percentile and uh, uh, take the minimum and maximum values that you're scaling the image to, uh, to sort of 99 percentile data, which is typically what we do. But you can change that and see how the image looks. So let's move on because uh, this, yeah. 
So while she is allocating the kernel again, I tell you what is happening because it is a very interesting thing supposed to happen anyway. So uh, when you are doing a matplotlib, uh, I'll take. Better? Yeah. So when, when we have matplotlib, right, you make a plot on a Google Colab. So the plotting is done on the server on Google, and Google sends an image for you on the screen, which is like one megabyte or two megabyte like that. But Plotly, because it is giving you interactive ability to zoom and play with the data, it is not sending you an image. It is sending you the data for that whole slice. So if the slice was, say, 2,000 pixel wide and 1,000 pixel long, that's 2 megapixels, multiplied by 4 bytes for each pixel. So that's 3,200 multi byte, 3,200 multiple, or how many, how much was it? 2,000 or 2 megabytes multiplied by 32 again. So that's a lot of data Plotly has to send back and forth from Google because all the data is getting sent, not its snapshot, so that you can zoom on the screen. But if you were doing it on your local computer, uh, where you were uh, just doing a Jupyter lab or a Jupyter notebook in your own computer, this problem will not happen with you. Uh, but this problem will happen because she's trying to show you a good image and the whole of the data is being sent by Google Colab from the Colab server onto your Chrome browser. So that is why it is taking that much of time. There are ways to optimize that and compress, uh, but that's something we did not want to go into for this talk, so we kept it simple. If uh, outside the talk, you run these notebooks locally, they will work pretty fast and you will not have this problem of uh, slow loading of plotly plots. I think I've got that. Yeah. Uh, so you can look at this function. Uh, so we made a function to, uh, it's a 2D slice viewer. So you can simply put in the uh, inlines and x lines that we want to plot and uh, look at it. I am going to stop this because I don't want it to crash again. So let's move on to well log data. Uh, so it's uh, another useful data for from, uh, data in uh, geophysical uh, studies or uh, exploration. Uh, typically, it's stored in a LAS file, which also contains header information uh, telling us about what sort of logs are there, uh, the geometry of where uh, the well is located or it can also be there in a CSV or a text file as well. Uh, so it contains uh, uh, the f uh, float data related to the different logs that we're loading, uh, that, that uh, we have acquired. Um, so let's load a LAS file. We're going to use LASIO for that. So we're going to import LASIO. Again. So in the meanwhile, let us look at these uh, uh, similar standard interface that we'd used for the uh, segway loading. We can use very similar interface for loading our LAS files. Uh, so this is what we talk about, that uh, uh, having these sorts of uh, defined settings, uh, defined classes um, gives us a good uh, starting point to uh, write our code. Uh, so again, we have our uh, uh, job config, uh, and then we have the associated uh, input, output, and settings. Um, for the settings, we have uh, the name of our depth mnemonic. Uh, so mnemonic is the way that the log has been uh, called uh, in the last file. Oh, right. Good enough, I think. 
and we have the logs that we're going to be uh, loading. So uh, we can, of course, change these uh, when we're actually defining it. Um, this is a similar uh, load well as cl a class similar to the load segwi. Um, so it, what it will do is that it will take the LAS file and convert it to a net CDF. So again, even with logs, we're trying to look at it uh, in an X array. And uh, in this case, the data will be the different logs uh, and uh, they will sit on depth. Uh, so let's run this. The kernel is back on. Before doing that, we'll also look at the headers of the last file. Uh, so uh, there's a last file already in this folder. Um, and we're looking at uh, the LASIO headers. So we're looking at what curves are there. So with LASIO, uh, uh, the, uh, using dot curves, we can see what logs are there. Um, and we can also look at the headers. So let's create that. Uh, summary of the last file. So these are the data frames we've created. And again, they contain information about uh, what curves are there uh, in this particular DF1 and the headers in this one. OK. So let me run this. So uh, we've written this function, uh, which loads the last file uh, uh, from the uh, uh, using this class. It takes in the last file and gives the NC file. Um, so I'd like you to look at uh, the four last files that are there in that folder. Um, so we have these files. And we're going to load it using uh, this function. So for all the files, we're going to uh, run the function load well as. And that should uh, convert our four, NC, uh, four last files to uh, four NC files, which we can then visualize. So this happens quicker because last files are not as heavy duty as segwi files. Uh, these are particularly some MBs. Uh, you can look at uh, the converted NC files are some MBs. So the job has run quicker. Uh, now let's move on to visualizing the well logs. Uh, so for, for our platform, uh, we use Plotly because, of course, it is uh, compatible. But uh, today we're going to be using Matplotlib to look at some of the styling that we can do uh, because uh, there are certain things that we need to keep in mind when we are plotting log plots. Uh, so if you're doing any sort of projects with uh, well logs um, and you're working with modifying the uh, data or processing it, so of course you'll need to look at the logs and see what changes uh, that is doing. So uh, these well log uh, visualization functions will come very handy uh, when you're trying to do any projects by yourself. Uh, so you can always look at them in this notebook. So we're going to load the uh, well logs from our net CDFs, which uh, are there in this folder. So we're going to load one of them. We're loading well uh, 15 and F1A. So this is the data frame. Let's look at the X array. So it has all these uh, logs sitting on the depth coordinate. And again, the dimension is also depth in this case. Uh, less complicated than a segwi file. Uh, so let's see what logs we have in this particular well. OK, so now we want to plot these logs. Uh, so how many of you have seen like what a lo uh, log plot looks like for a well? OK, so you'd know that uh, we need to make sure of certain things. We need to make sure that uh, the depth axis is going from minimum to maximum because that is we're going inside the earth uh, and it needs to to sort of represent the logging that has happened while uh, the uh, we've acquired the data so um, so we have this uh, function um, 
and uh, this particular function is taking in uh, reading it different logs and then plotting it and we've done it in this way so that we can uh, style the different uh, uh, curves and we have sort of some flexibility of uh, what uh, uh, limits we want to give to the x-axis and how we want to look at the curve and sometimes we uh, it's not uh, necessarily standard that we'll plot from the minimum to the maximum value we we need to have some information about what log we're looking at and how we want to look at it. Sometimes we're going to plot it on the log scale, um, or otherwise more commonly we're going to plot it on a linear scale. Uh, so uh, you can, of course, play along, uh, play, uh, play with this uh, function uh, and have uh, styling for your own self, but uh, we've written it in this way so that uh, you can have flexibility of uh, styling p the particular log uh, by yourself and uh, it has a counter so you can add more log curves and uh, it, the code will work the same. So we're using a particular function to look at the uh, gamma rays so we're uh, using uh, variable color plots because that sort of uh, gives a quicker visualization of where the gamma values are high and that would typically give us, uh, give us some sort of information okay that this is the depth interval that we're interested in. So let us look at how the uh, log plot looks like. So you can play along with this and uh, I'd encourage you to look at this function and think of some of the uh, dry principles that we'd mentioned. So uh, since we were plotting each curve separately, there's, a, uh, there's some repetition. And uh, you can, I, I'd encourage you to modify it and see where uh, the repetition is not necessary. In some cases, uh, it's not necessary to plot each curve separately. So you can try out some of those functions and good practices there. And you can also uh, try to see this in Plotly. So, So this is our uh, log plot. Uh, and this is raw data, so uh, it has some spikes. So uh, there are four uh, wells that we've provided. So you can try to plot them by yourself. Uh, maybe take a couple minutes, look at uh, what the function is, what it is doing, and uh, just simply change the well name and try to plot a different well. You can try that, it's pretty simple. Were you guys able to uh, follow along and plot the uh, well curves? Because we're going to be using the, these wells in uh, the next exercise when we're doing ML. So you can just take a look. Uh, so, I know a lot of you were not able to get the Google data uploaded. So, other than just the solution notebook, what we will also do is uh, put a small video on YouTube, again, where we would show you what needs to be changed to load the data. Uh, we'll post it on our LinkedIn post. You can get the link from there. And also, our YouTube channel will have that video. So, whatever we discussed, I think IITB is going to publish some of it. But some of the things we were not able to cover because of shortness of time, uh, we would post solutions so you don't have to wonder. We'll tell you exactly what steps you need uh, after you have uploaded the data to Google to replicate whatever has been done now and whatever Nipple is going to show. So don't worry, just tag along, see what is happening. And you can look at that video and uh, resume doing yourself. And 
Also, we are going to put a post out at the end of the conference to get a feedback. Uh, you can let us know if needed. We would do a couple of small uh, online sessions where whoever is interested can join and we can help them finish the exercises and uh, get some more one-on-one uh, -on -one time with you also. All right? OK. So let's move on. So we can see that there are some spikes in this data. And we, when you want to use it further for uh, any sort of project, but uh, right now for our ML project, we want to get rid of these. Um, and these could be there for a multitude of reasons. So of course, when uh, data is being recorded, it's not perfect. Uh, so the well logs could have some NAN values. Uh, the amplitudes could also be sp uh, spurious. Uh, so we'll need to correct for that. Um, and it could also be uh, the fact that the sensor was not working for a particular interval, so which is why those spikes have been recorded. Uh, so we're going to be using a rolling window method uh, to uh, sort of um, do some statistical manipulation in that window and get rid of those spikes. So uh, uh, we can do uh, different sorts of manipulations, uh, but uh, in this uh, particular case, we, we're going to be using uh, the Z score um, and uh, using it to uh, get rid of those spikes in that particular region. So it's going to be taking that window, looking at what the outliers are for that particular window, and then we're going to be getting rid of them. So let's run this function. So uh, we're taking values till uh, 2 sigma for, for uh, the window that we want to keep, and then removing all outliers after after it. So if you know uh, about normal distribution, that is what I'm talking about. So let's look at the plot uh, after the despiking. So you can see here some, some things were off. Uh, if you look at the uh, gamma ray range, it's pretty wide, and this is not uh, very standard. So it could be that there are some spikes in it. Uh, and the resistivity log also was spiky for a particular uh, part. So look at these logs, uh, look at this portion after the despiking. And yeah, so for the resistivity, you can see that the spikes are gone. And let us look at the range of the gamma ray log. So now it seems close to more standard. Uh, so uh, this is one example of uh, the pre-processing. But uh, like I said, it's statistical manipulation of dealing with outliers. So you can look at this function, go through this function, and maybe use a different technique. Uh, if, if you're using a rolling window technique, maybe do some different sort of statistical manipulation. So I, I, I hope this gave you guys uh, some idea of how to load and visualize uh, geophysical data when, when you guys are trying to do your projects. And also gave you uh, an idea of how, uh, we, uh, how we deal with uh, data when, we, when we're doing our projects and uh, building our products. Uh, so are, are we breaking now? <laughs>